Welcome to the Weird and the Weary. I'm Jason, and with me is Kevin. That's me. And Lee. You know who it is, man. Lee Noble. That's right. That guy. Yeah, me. And today we're here to talk to you about the tale of two writers who were uh, writing the same genre, but, uh, you know, similar genre, kind of. Um, but uh, both uh, had some uh, struggles in their careers. And we're going to be talking about Taylor Caldwell and Octavia Butler. And they uh, both, uh, I mean, they, they kind of wrote like speculative fiction. Um, and, and I think Butler was more and more sci-fi. Yeah, she was more she was more sci fi right. driven. And uh both fantastic tales here. So let's get right into it. Um let's have any you guys read any speculative fiction? Oh yeah. A ton. Like uh for instance, like like uh Margaret Atwood is she writes a lot of speculative fiction. Like um Only had to read one book by her in high school. Which and one I was don't that? remember it. I read the the like, Mad Adam series that she wrote where um hmm. Like the world is uh, accepting um, genetic manipulation. So, mm. oh, so like Brave New World kind of stuff. Yeah. That's, uh, oh, okay. Right, right. So, and then, but it just, you know, of course, plunges the world in chaos. Of course. Sure. Yeah. Well, man becomes greater than what they are, you know, essentially. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's what spec fic is, speculative, speculative fiction. Gotcha. I, I like the genre, personally. It's one of my one of my favorites. Sure, uh, yeah. You know, it's a good time. Thinking about what could be, maybe. You, know, you never know. Change one thing. You then know. you could end up with Bioshock. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Wow. Who's your daddy? What does he do? We're all our own daddies. That was a, that was a great series. Love that game. Bioshock? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I like the first one. The second one I kind of fell out on, to be honest. The Bioshock Infinite. I didn't play it. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. I watched him play he that. He watched me play that. Some wild stuff. Good stuff. Oh, yeah. 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 And then just that, that weird paradoxical, mm-hmm. you know, you're, you're your own dad. <sighs> Spoilers. No, no, not this one, though. No. Okay. You're your own grandpa. <gasps> Futurama spoilers. Yes. You're your own son. I really fucked myself. <laughs> he does. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, look, <laughs> speculative fiction definitely has its place. And uh, life and fiction are an interesting couple. And sometimes working harmoniously together or against one another. Uh, in a fight to the bitter end, yet nothing makes one more weary than being told that you can't do something. Or, you know, being told that you're not able or, or worthy of it. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that, that can infuriate you pretty easily. Yeah, uh-huh. that, that's where the rebelling comes in. Yeah. You know, as soon as you say, don't do something, I'm going to do I'm it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to touch the <clears> stove. <throat> do that. Right. That's hot. No, well, don't touch it. It's hot. Yeah. Well, it's, ah, you know, What's that. hot mean? Oh. Right. It starts oh, at an early age. I thought you meant spicy. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's milk, right? I was Kevin? tasting it. Yeah. It's, uh, I can't even stand the medium milk. I just need the mild only. Mild milk. Cool milk. <laughs> Menthol milk. Does your stuff have flour in it? Why? You have a gluten problem? No, it's too spicy. It's too, it's too spicy for me. So, yeah, re- rebellion definitely gets sparked, uh, you know, mostly, I think, in youth. Uh, you know, especially, Like being told, don't, don't do that. You can't do that. You'll never be able to do that. You'll never be able to rock star Kevin. You Cut your hair. You can't tell me what to do. And then... Boy, you better do what I say. No. Listen to your mama. Most of us eventually cut our hair and, and stop the rock band stuff. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, but, but some of us, we, we, we keep, it, keep it strong. Sure. And you know, a few small percentage get to be on, on albums, and, and the rest are still either in the garage or at the bar. Yeah, I still got the guitar in the basement. See, and it's not even tuned, probably. Oh, probably not yeah, at this point. Know. It's been a whole, a while. Wait, wait, wait. I got to join in here. I yeah. have a drum set. Yeah. He has a bass. All right. Three right. piece. Oh, man. We, we got the cod pieces. This could be an amazing band. This could be like... Uh, three cods. Three. 
<laughs> three co- three cods and a bass player. I'm like, wait, what? Three G's and a cod. Three G's oh. and a cod. <laughs> three OGs and a cod. And see, my bass is a. It's an old stand up, and I have one string, but. You could really get funky with one Good. string. Yeah, I uh, pretty sure I learned that from the Aristocats. Yeah, that was that was a great way of uh, yeah the the trash can and the yeah, yeah, yeah. and the broomstick. Yeah, my drum set's just a bunch of trash cans and stuff mm-hmm. that I put together. Oh, right. perfect. Now, yeah. we're yeah. not like Stomp. And I use like, walks. I use walks for right. Crash, not crash. We were right. at a we. Well, I, I met up with him. I told him to come to Ocean State Job Lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, dude, walks are six ninety nine. <laughs> Bring a hundred bucks. We're right. gonna get a fucking three piece. Right, we're gonna buy a three ninety nine hammer and we're gonna flatten them a little. Get some sound. Give me the fucking Neil Pert of garbage. <laughs> and that's all because my mom said I could never do the drums. I could never play the drums. Sure. Oh yeah. So, that's when I took my little clapper monkey apart. That's when it just started. I took those symbols, little tiny ones. Did, did you peel ones. its its fur off its face and then you saw the the magnet, you know, the the mechanical face and then you're like, yeah. I want robot sex, for sure. <laughs> no, I took all the hair off the top of its head and put it on its face. <laughs> oh! Extra so like hairy. a woolly, woolly willy. Except, she, <laughs> except he, his, his mouth opens up. Willy! Willy! <laughs> you know, I have to admit something. I'm going to admit this to the audience as well. When I was a child, I had a Yoda puppet. Remember the... It was like a rubber molded puppet. Oh, I, yeah, I, I've seen that one. And, and you I, know, and the hands could like, go together. That's like the only fucking thing you have. Like, go, I had a Boglin, too, that was made out of the same shit. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was a dumbass kid at seven. I had like scalpels and shit, and I'm like cutting into it like, oh, I'm going to act like I'm com- uh, performing brain surgery on Yoda. Mm-hmm. So I like cut it open and shit. But it was just, you know, it was just, just to open, right. but like it went back, but I feel like an idiot. <laughs> I'm like, well, what the fuck was I doing? <laughs> One time, I thought you were going to tell me you were doing it while your hand was in it. <laughs> Dude, oh, I left my <laughs> hand. What? In it. It's real. Oh my it's god! Real. I'm so sorry, Yoda. <laughs> I'm so sorry. You, you're punishing me by giving me pain. <laughs> That's what it must feel like. When I was nine, I had a friend, you know, the weird kid friend. Who, sure. But he was a latchkey kid, also, so it was kind of fun to hang out with him because you could just play Nintendo or whatever, you know. But in his room was like this big knockoff Cabbage Patch Kid, mm-hmm. but it was big. It was like twice the size of a Cabbage Patch Kid, and it was it was dressed up and uh, well, just to like go on the rebellion thing, you know. Like he wore sweater vests. He like was a you know he, his mom dressed him up funny. Okay, and he had this doll. In his room, in a chair, and like he had all of his cool shit. He had Close Encounters of the of the Third Kind poster, even mm-hmm. had the record, you know, and he had all this cool shit. But he had that fucking doll, and he hated it. And I was like, man, that thing is just so girly. Like, why do you have that? I've had it since I was a kid. My mom won't let me get rid of it. I was like, well, she's not here. Let's let's get rid of it. Mm-hmm. And. I meant, like, take it out and throw it away. No, man. He took it as, like... Let's play with it. Stab it up. Nice. Oh. He stabbed it up. He stabbed it. Like, he fucking murdered this doll. And then he drew, like, red lines all over it, you know? And, and I mean, I'm kind of stabbed it, like, to you know, <laughs> let it join in. Oh, but, sure. You got to. Otherwise, you're the next, you get the next doll on the block. God, this was, like, third grade. All right, so he was the dorky, quiet kid in third grade. He drew airplanes really well. Mm-hmm. In I, next year, fourth grade, mm-hmm. he was the one like fucking beating people up and like, yeah, it, it, he just he that doll seemed to just hold him back. Oh my god, you created a fucking bully. I just meant to throw it away, but it, he stabbed it like we, you know, third grade. What's that like eight? Do you remember? Don't, yeah. don't you don't have to say the person's name, but do you remember it? Yeah. Have you looked it up in like you know news? No, no, You're I don't want to. to yeah, I'm you? afraid to. Yeah, because yeah, he was a weird insane. kid. He had like the big ghost <laughs> eyes, you yeah, know, and he yeah. would just kind of talk about poltergeist a lot and you know okay, shit see, like that. Yeah, yeah, see that. And, and usually, it, usually stuff like that. There's something else going on, right? There. I didn't, I didn't promote. Stabbing this thing to death. Too no, late. no, no, you did not. You, you totally cr- didn't. You created a monster. <laughs> I, I, I just, un- I, I uncaged the monster. Maybe all his bad feelings were contained within the doll. 
Wait a minute. That's why he moved out this way from where he was before. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's adding up now. I like it. But that's what rebellion can lead to. Yeah, that's crazy. Insane. But some rebels are meant to be re- remembered. In this case, I'm not sure because there's a little sketchiness with this lady. But Miss Taylor Caldwell, born 1900. Now, she was born in Manchester to a Scottish family. Now, here's a cool part. Scottish family, supposedly descended from the McGregor clan. Hmm. You mean, like, the tennis shoes? (laughs) Those are tennis shoes? No, it was MC. It wasn't MAC, was it? Oh, you're right. Damn. So close. So close. That was the Irish one. But oh, you mean okay? Then you mean the farmer from Peter Rabbit, Mister McGregor? But uh, no, so this lady, she she was a bit of a prodigy. We, we we talk about them prodigies sometimes, but she started writing when she was like six, and she, like even like four, I think. But at six years old, she won a medal for an essay on Charles Dickens, and then she emigrated to the U.S. in 1907. So, like, after that medal, they're just like, yeah, this kid has to come to the U.S. Like, let's just... No, there was more an attempt to find a better life, because I guess the their time there wasn't that great. And then, plus, I guess maybe, you know, they were looking for uh, other opportunities outside of the U.K. So they're sure. coming to America. They came right. to America. Medal-winning writer going to America, sure. Yeah, you never know. Back then, they were probably like, oh, look at this child. She's going to America. Okay, she's going to be rich. Yeah, this is like child acting, you know, except this is a little special case because she could write really well for a child. Yeah, I mean, she started writing stories at eight. And now here's the thing. This is one book. It came out in 75. But apparently at the age of 12 years old, she wrote this book, Romance of Atlantis. And basically, it's about... This Atlantean uh, kingdom, this royalty, they're like, you know, wealthy, strong, all mm-hmm. this stuff. And they have this ritual where they basically, this tradition where they marry into this lower sort of Atlantean tribe to sort of like bring the people, the, the common the common people and the powerful people together. And it's just like spoiler, this crazy stuff. This is Aquaman, the movie <sighs> Aquaman. That is a big spoiler. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm just kidding. I'm pretty sure they all they all are forced to become humans at the end. Oh no, that's the whole thing. We're the Atlanteans. Sounds like a Tina Belcher fanfic from Bob's Burgers. No, but it was based L- off more a dream. butts though. We need more butts. Yeah, right. She had a dream over like two years. It was a recurring dream, mm-hmm. and what would happen is she would have the dream, mm-hmm. and then the next night the dream would pick up where it left off the night before. Oh, I wish I had that ability. Yeah, right. That, that sounds so good. So amazing. Two years straight. This is what she claimed. She couldn't, sometimes she couldn't even tell what was real, what wasn't. She actually thought, like, this was her life. Wow. You she know, might like, have gotten to that moldy rye. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> At, like, what, 10? She had it for, like, 10 years. I mean, two years. So she was 12 when she said she wrote it. So she had to have been 10 years old. Well, I mean, start having this dream. I have a friend who says he remembers all of his dreams, and he's described plenty of them. So, mm-hmm. I, you know, I believe him, and that, it, and I'm jealous of that too. It's just such a remarkable thing. Like, I have some dreams that I remember bits. Yeah, you know, but it, it goes away. Uh, but to have a good dream that is in segments for two years, man, like that's. She had Netflix in her head in the, you know, in the teens here, 19, 1910, you know, or was it? 19, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. right on the money, 1910. So, <laughs> you know, she was kind of like uh, it, just Notre Dame is almost. She just had Netflix going, you know, already knew about it. Yeah, man, she she should have been entering those contests of, like, you know, what, what the future's going to be like. Yeah. That would have been nice. She's like, oh, I just took a nap about this. I'm ready. But, so... Yeah, so her uh, so she tried to publish this book back in when she was twelve, and her grandfather had a publishing company, and uh, she brought it there and stuff. And you know what they said, right? Um, what what do you what do you think they said to this little girl who came in with this fantastical, speculative, this fantastical story, this fantasy tale that was about almost two hundred pages, I think a little over two hundred pages. Probably asked her who wrote it. 
Exactly. Mm-hmm. They accused her of plagiarism. Yeah. They said there's no way a 12-year-old could have written this. Bullshit. Right. So she had to wait. Did they steal her candy, too? Probably. <laughs> yeah, they probably slapped her. Slapped her with a uh, silverfish. Like a book-eating one? Just a big one? Just... But in Texas, though. Yeah. I digress. <laughs> They fry everything. That's all I got to say. So, and it's funny because it's her grandfather's publishing place. So you'd think she'd have a little clout, but no, no, you're you're a liar. Get out of your little girl. Give me your bubble gum. But you know what? Another, you know, on the flip side, what it could have been too. They'd be like, "Look at this fucker with his publishing company. He's acting as if his twelve year old granddaughter wrote this fucking story, and he happens to have a fucking publishing house. Bullshit. Mm-hmm. So they might have been mad that she wasn't Taylor Flagate, twelve year old. <laughs> Whiskey, huh? Right, because this is the teen. You know, this is a uh, well. This is before prohibition, so you know, the booze is flowing. They were talking about it. Though. Right, they could have used a cup of the hooch and the and you know <laughs> they're running that print and press and smelling that ink. I keep going back to this laudanum and shit, but hey, it's the time period. <laughs> I keep hacking up pulp dust. I can't even help it. Get out of here, kid. <laughs> hey, have some coke. I'm not thirsty. Yeah, you're stupid. <laughs> here's some cocaine gum. Get out of here. <laughs> cocaine sucker pop. Here, here's a, here's a coke gum. Here's some coffee. Go see your mom. Here's a kitty. That's probably how she got the writing done. A little laudanum at night, a little cocaine in the morning. Oh, There's a lot sure. of that good shit going around. That so. would explain the health issues later, maybe. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, you, you party hard and not even know it. You're just going to catch up to you regardless. But our lovely Taylor, she, when she first published her novel, Dynasty of Death, in 1938, she was 38 years old, housewife living in Buffalo, New York. She was married at the time to Marcus, Marcus Reback. And um, she was married to him until he died in 71. But she basically wrote this book. It followed this multi-generational tale of this family, the Bouchard, the Barbers, the Bouchards and the Barbers. Mm -hmm. And they basically created a, they had a small munitions company. So they were selling bombs, bullets, whatever. Mm Mm-hmm. And over time, they become this huge conglomerate. They're international, blowing people away and showing the family. Literally. Yeah, blowing them away. Hmm. So it was a little series that she had done for a bit. And it was, uh, let me see, followed them in two other stories. It was The Eagles Gather in 1940 and The Final Hour in 1944. These all sound like nice bleak titles. Yeah. Well, look where she came from, man. Born in Manchester into a Scottish family, emigrates to the U.S. in 1907. And then everybody who read this, they're like, wow, man, Taylor Caldwell? That dude's fucking great. Holding it down right now. Oops, I'm sorry. Vernacular, wrong century. (laughs) Taylor. That dude. You you gotta read this guy's stuff. You gotta read Taylor. You gotta read Taylor called well you gotta read it it's good stuff and at the same time you know she's probably like walking out in the shops and hearing this and being like my word oh yeah definitely. they think they think this she, they think i'm a man or not or even just you know from uh the the publishers you know like y- y- they hear things of course they're they I, I would assume they probably try to keep her uh to keep it as a as a guy well, yeah, you would think they would, because if it was automatically assumed, then they weren't pushing that it was a woman. Right. You know, which yeah. is like, again, the uh, unfortunate victim of the time. Mm-hmm. True. And, you know, that that's uh, it's an unfortunate you know, side effect uh, that lasted uh, until now still you know <laughs> yeah, up to up to present day <laughs> unfortunately um in many different facets many different forms yeah it's uh you know this man's world thing uh it's kind of confusing even though we we recognize uh you know people with uh intelligence and breasts you know like we, they're still treated as lesser people or <laughs> assumed to be men or you know like even even uh, talent that that were women that pretended to be men 
throughout their careers. You know, it's just, uh, it's crazy. To it, me. it is. It is. But, you know, she dealt with it. She had a long career. You know, she wrote like 40 plus books and, um, she was also a part of John Birch Society. Another, another member, another, uh, topic. What was it? Uh, George Schuyler. He was associated with them oh. in the Audubon Society, I believe there. Ah, Audubon Society. Man, his, uh, his George daughter. George Schuyler, huh? Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even though he, yeah, they actually probably would have, they probably would have run into each other, I think. <sighs> Crossover episode. Right, yeah. yeah, this is, you know, they probably have them in the same social circles, um, definitely, yeah. I would imagine. And she uh, also associated with the supposed anti-Semitic group Liberty Lobby, and uh, that that's, you know, it's a little, a little sketchy. Because, you know, my father introduced me to Taylor Caldwell. It was uh, Romance of Atlantis and uh, The Devil's Advocate, which was pretty damn interesting. And it's not based, the movie is not based on this book. Damn it, because I wanted to talk about Keanu. So in 1970, 70 years old at this point, just about, she started to delve into reincarnation. Well, she she probably really wanted to because she, what, she had a stroke, she was deaf. Yeah, right? she had she a has... stroke in 65, I think it was. And she was deaf longer than that, right? Yeah, she was deaf on uh, 65. 65, she was deaf. I mean, I guess that could bring out the hatred of, you know, the Jews. But I don't know. I mean. Yeah, but yeah, she had. She was deaf. Went, she went, my great grandma went blind. She didn't start spouting, you know, anti Semitic hate. So. <laughs> no. But yeah, she by 65, she was deaf. She was completely deaf. And she was shouting anti-Semitic hate because she couldn't hear herself. She didn't realize it. It was undiagnosed Tourette's. No, it was just racism. Yeah, it was undiagnosed racism. But, you know, that's the life of a conservative back then, I guess. Sure. And maybe, just like Mr. Schuyler. Oh, man, he, he died. He died. He did. He really did. He really did. But she was married to Mr. Rebeck until he died in 71. But I guess apparently in 1947, according to, according to a Time magazine article, he had burned approximately 140 manuscripts of unpublished novels. Why? None. I didn't delve further into it. Maybe it was a, a fit of rage or maybe he was upset that she was writing. Everything was in all caps because she couldn't hear so like, no, this, this is, is this was this was uh, eighteen years before. <laughs> eighteen. Well, years. the hearing could have started been starting to go. You know, like they're eating dinner. What? 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 He's like, oh, and then he reads some of these manuscripts. They're all caps. Even some like words are just spelled out in all capital letters. Like, no, no, the he, is all you know. T is all capital T's. And, you know. Or he he was just really sick and tired of her always saying, you know, I, what? 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 He just took those manuscripts. Like you hear this, huh? <laughs> crackling. And fire. she couldn't hear that. He's trying to make copies of it. And then that's when she said, "What?" And he just fucking. That's what he did. Yeah, he's trying to make dittos. Yeah. And he stayed with her until his death, twenty four years later. He's like, "I got a burner, right?" And then when he was a ghost, you know, he just stayed warm by the ghostly ashes of the manuscripts. The bonfire. I can't even scare. Her. She doesn't even, she doesn't even hear my chains rattle. <laughs> <laughs> they, they have any kids? They had kids, right? They had one child. One child. Her name was Judith. Ooh, pretty. And she had a child earlier with another guy, William Combs, and she was married to him for about 12 years. And he probably got sick of her asking what all the time, too. What? Maybe she was the original. Yeah, yeah, she was the original hype man. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, indubitably. Yeah, that's where, yeah, that's where little John got it from. He just, what? yeah, yeah, yeah. He okay. Heard about the, somebody wrote probably wrote a book about their their struggles in their marriage, just solely about that. Like, pass the butter, please. What? <laughs> <laughs> he acted it out. He's like, I wonder how they they he's dealt with one another. Taylor, please. What? Pass the butter. 
Okay. <laughs> and then she just hands him salt. Ugh. Well, you see, dear William, I wish you would just ask me nicely as opposed to yelling at me. Get, what? Get back to Atlantis with you. Back to Atlantis. Get your trident and get the fuck out. <laughs> but, but yeah, poor uh, her daughter Judith, who her father was Marcus, and um, apparently they, they fought. They had a uh, long dispute over her father's estate, and especially since uh, Taylor decided to shack up with a William Everett Stanso uh, retired a of real names. estate. A lot of names for a, a man. I know. William Everett Stanso. Sounds like a command. Just call me Wes. But yeah, I, I, I went out of turn with that, but I'm sorry. But that was in 72. They were only married for a year, divorced a year later. And then six years later, she met William Presty, 17 years younger than her. A, a Canadian. Oh, well. She a met, Canadian? A Canadian. Okay. He smelled of maple. His well, hair felt like moose fur. Maybe. I mean, he could have just really been a fan. Like, he's just kind of like, uh, 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 hello, hello. I, I really like the ro- romance of Atlantis, because uh, I know that I am a, maybe a fish person, too. Is that, you know, like, maybe, I don't know, you know. I said Canadian, I didn't say Norwegian. <laughs> that was pretty, I, that was a kind of a hoser, I don't know. I, I haven't watched Strange Brew in many, I've many years. I've watched a lot of Strange Brew, eh? I know, that wasn't, definitely, definitely was not a Canadian accident. Accidents. Accident. There's no Canadian. Right. I don't know. No, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Whatever that was, was definitely an accident. Yes, that, that whole that whole accident was an accident. Wait, did you guys see Step Brothers? Because I'm just imagining that second William. Showing for two Williams, huh? I'm just imagining the second William as like when he kicks in the door and it's a giant lumberjack, and he's like, "I've traveled 1,200 miles to give you my seed." <laughs> <laughs> I, if you want it, yeah. I, what? <laughs> what? 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 You want what? <laughs> you want to give me what? <laughs> no, the dogs have already been peed. It's okay. <laughs> Seventeen years. To, well, well, hey, you know, it's okay. That's fine. Love Just, happens. Let's let's play the math game. Do 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 do. Seventy eight. She was born in nineteen hundred. Do 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 do. Right. I think this is like Harold and Maude a little bit. So she's seventy eight, but you no, know, he's sixty one. He's a respectable sixty one. So right. she did the math. She did the half my age plus seven. She's mm-hmm. she's way. Sure. Like, she's super in the clear. She's way in the clear. Yeah, she's way ahead of, of the game. You know, she already knew the game before it was really even a game. That's good. But actually, she, she. I don't know. As you get older, as you get older, should you? Up that number? Should and she'd be you, like, shouldn't you up the denominator? Well, I mean, she might just say, like, yes, half your age plus seven. Something a Jew wouldn't do, you know? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, Taylor. You, you're so fucking racist right now, Taylor. <laughs> I, I guess you know, the older you get, you, the, your values change. Or you just don't give a fuck because you're like, I'm going to die soon anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's like getting hit in the back of the leg of the supermarket by you know, an older person because... The fucking bananas aren't... They're, they're all green except for that one bunch. They gotta get past you because if they don't get them, they're gonna die. And who's gonna eat those fucking bananas? Not me. Maybe. The Jews. The Jews are gonna eat all the bananas. It's gonna... Taylor. You're so weird, Taylor. But Miss Caldwell, with her reincarnations, who she believes she had 11 previous lives for a current one and so forth, she would wind up dying... But before that, we were talking about her daughter, Judith. Mm -hmm. She unfortunately committed suicide in 79. Oh, that's that's unfortunate. And then her mother would pass away six years later in Greenwich, Connecticut, August 30th, 1985, at the age of 85. And uh, it just seems like, you know, Presty just seems like somebody would just be confused the whole time. Doesn't even know what's going on. Oh, I, why, why are you mad at me, Judith? What? <laughs> well, she didn't have a hearing problem, too. No, I, I wouldn't. See, that's the thing. I don't. I wonder if she learned sign language, or she just, you know, wrote notes. Well, it sounds like he was probably a freeloader. He, you know, he was probably doing some elder abuse. Um, probably took advantage. I'm sure. Well, yeah, that's what I mean, she was. She was a prolific writer, so mm-hmm. you know, it wasn't like she was. It didn't have any money or anything. So. He, He's probably a leech, and that's what uh, 
caused the rift between Judith and, and, and her mother, really. Yeah. Um, to the point, you know, to that point, that that's unfortunate that that happened. Um, cause you should never really get to that point. No, you shouldn't have to. Not knowing much about William Presty and the type of person he was, uh, yeah, it could be a real piece of crap. Mr. Could Presty, be. I hope you were a good man. Is he, is he still kicking? I don't know. Not much about Mr. Presty around. He may have changed his name. He's on to the next one. On to the next one. No, but he was 61 back then, so. Right, so he's probably not kicking yeah, anymore. Yeah, I don't think he's kicking anymore. That was about, that was 40 years ago. Oh, God. He, yeah, Mr. Presty. Yeah. <laughs> he's not coming back anytime, so. No, he's not getting the reincarnation. So going from that, going from a, a, a writer who was mistaken as, as a different gender and... You know, led kind of a. Know, it seems like you know it's a life that is never fulfilled, really. To another writer who kind of uh, broke the mold, I guess, so to speak, um, and and changed opinions instead of you know being thrust into the the mainstream opinions of the era. And her name is Octavia Butler, and she's born on June twenty second, nineteen forty seven, and. Pasadena, California, little baby, little little young baby in Pasadena. <laughs> <laughs> she was born to um, Octavia Margaret Gee. Is it Gee? Guy. Guy? Uh, and she was a uh, housemaid, and her father, uh, Larice James Butler, he's a shoeshine man. And that job is, I, I watched uh, like a little thing about shoeshine, like a, a dedicated real shoeshine person. That's like a, a real intensive thing that you do. Like, like there's a lot of care that goes into that. Oh, yeah. It's, and, not, it's not as easy as one, as one may think. Right. And in this era, you know, like it was, it was a profession that, you know, I mean, like you needed your shiny shoes, to go to the board meeting, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. your feet are under the table, but hopefully that gleam hits your face. I don't know. I don't know how it worked. <laughs> but her father died when she was seven, and she was raised by her widowed mother and her grandmother in a really strict Baptist household. And that could be a, a big cause for rebellion. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sounds uh, pretty tense. Sure. Yeah, they're like, if I'm hitting the hell fight, and fuck it, I'm bringing some hell. <laughs> right. You know, like you sneeze, the devil's in you. You know, you better go hit yourself with a rock. I don't know how extreme it is, but... You know the devil gives you those sexy thoughts. But, <laughs> Stupid sexy devil. <laughs> and you don't want sexy thoughts, they lead to naughty actions. Right, that's that's the Baptist way, I guess. Yeah. There's a hand hook somewhere on the table. See it? That's it's the... really small. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, see that? It's, yeah, you're, everything is just... You You have the devil in you. Yep. It looks like... Yeah, definitely uh, that page. I've, yeah, it's the devil and everywhere. The, and there's a Tom Chick comic on the very back. For good stuff. Oh, we're going back. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, Octavia's mother, she'd bring her along on her maid jobs. Um, you know, have her enter in the back entrance uh, rather than the front because folk didn't go in the front entrance. Nope, not back then. Not back then. Mm mm. Um, you know, she endured a, a plenitude of racist and demeaning uh, insults, and Octavia noticed them. You know, but I, it, the fucking adage, I hate this fucking adage, like, oh, that was the times. But, you know, what was cool is that because she was in Pasadena, it was more diverse. So she, even though there were times where she would see that, like, her, her mother would be, you know, they would say some pretty nasty things to her mom, but she was able to play with different kids that weren't like her and stuff like that. So, right, right. You know, that that that's what helps her, I believe, that was a part of the foundation of where her writing came from. Uh, right, and, and regardless of uh, growing up in a diverse neighborhood, she was still a shy kid. Yeah, very shy and uh, dyslexic, slightly dyslexic. dyslexic. And, and very tall. Yeah, she was the tall girl. Very tall, mm-hmm. which... Uh, she stood out. Must have been a thing because my my mother was a, a tall girl and she got made fun of all the time. You know, they called her all different names and 
Usually, like, you know, well, the normal's giant, right. Frankenstein. Right. Oh, yeah. look at you. Children will find anything to, to nitpick on and, and make fun of. Mm-hmm. But uh, a tall girl seems to be picked on a lot, even though that's really normal <laughs> in, in the ways of anatomy. Uh, women mm-hmm. uh, tend to grow taller first. Than, yeah. you know, I mean, it's just a thing. But kids suck. Yeah, well, that's the first person they see to pick on. They're like Ooh. scanning the room and like, right. there they are. Right. I was a tall kid. I got picked on all the time. You know, it was just. It's almost that thing of who's not like us. Who's yeah. more unlike us than like us? Right. Mm-hmm. Let's pinpoint them. The kid wearing McGregor's. <laughs> He's different. He doesn't have any money. In the cloud. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Having dyslexia, that that's something. Uh, there was no no therapy for dyslexia back then, so she it, it took great lengths to to read uh, through a book and uh, even write properly. You know, I, I grew up in a household with dyslexia. I've seen it firsthand. Uh, I've um, tutored kids before um, when I was you know like in, in high school uh, or and help them with, with stuff like that. And it's, it's tough. They get, they get really frustrated with that world. Sure. I could see that. Sure. Cause everything is just kind of broken. A yeah, little it's bit. just jumbled up a little. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like they're seeing thing, you know, it's not, you know, it's not like a visual distortion or anything, but it's more of a, just like a hiccup in the brain kind of, that makes it difficult to retain and, and, and notice how, Word patterns are. Um, I'm not quoting anything medically. This is just from my own experience. That's what I've noticed. Because I would see my brother like write his name with backwards letters all the time, mm. you know, and, or uh, just different cap- capitalizations, different places, stuff like that. And, uh, gotcha. But I do that too. I notice now in my regular writing, I do like mixes of capitals and lowercase and regular words. Camel case. Yeah. <laughs> Is that what it's called? Is that, uh, oh, I don't know. Oh, well, you might have coined something new. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was the thing, computer science stuff. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's uh, very tough, but she she really devoured these books at a rapid pace. And she was an avid fan of sci-fi and fantasy fiction um, and decided at the early age of 10 that she was going to become a writer. Yeah, she asked her mother for a Remington typewriter. That's huge. Yeah, that's uh I mean that if a kid's asking for something like that, that that's important. You got to recognize something like that. That's not a toy. That's nothing goofy. It's not an easy bake oven, you know. It's it's it, this is a fucking this is a real writer's uh typewriter. Man. This is a professional typewriter. This is serious shit. Yeah. It's time to recognize you've got a nerd on your hands. That's right. <laughs> And, not, and to even, and on top of that, um, you talking about the importance of them asking for that and the symbolism behind that, but also going back to the times, it's, it's, it's messed up that not only do you have to deal with people that don't know you, who just look at you automatically assume things, right. you have people within your own family that try to dissuade you. Sure. You know, she had her aunt say to her, you know, when she expressed her willingness to be a writer, her, her, her need to be a writer, her aunt says, her, honey, Negroes can't be writers. Right. And again, you know, that go back to that shitty adage. Mm-hmm. That was the mentality then. You know, uh, people just accept it. They're like, well, I don't see anyone. Every time someone else tries to do something, this happens. I'm just going to stop. Right. That's 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 def- that's deflating. Yeah. And we we we'd have we'd have nothing we'd have no culture at all if 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 people adhered to that philosophy exactly and 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 going back to rebellion you know uh, uh, saying something like that to a small child who's determined yeah lights that fire yeah sparks it right up and 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 inspires determination because you're not going to tell her what to do you know this kid. Hell's no. This kid's already <laughs> already facing uh, adversity with with, with uh, dyslexia and reading books at an alarming pace, mm-hmm. you know, and, and 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 battling it in her own way and doing it herself. And now she wants to write, and she's 
She's going to do it, regardless of what anyone says. Yeah, she's got adversity through, like, every step of every interaction she's got at this point. She's like, whatever, just get in line. Exactly. Because it's a male-dominated field as it is right now. You know, you got, uh, uh, like, the old old sci-fi rags from from that era, from the 40s and 50s. Like, uh, what was his name? Uh, The Grey Lensman series, you know, like E.E. Cummings and... um, Mm. Uh, I can't remember some other ones right now, but well, that was also during the time of like Conan. Well, even before that, yeah, like uh, uh, who's the guy there wrote Conan? Robert, right? Like Robert Howard, right? Like uh, you know, Robert Howard had a very successful run with his his series. Uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs was Tarzan, sure, a little earlier than than now, but yeah, um, <laughs> then, well, then we're talking about now, but. Uh, but still, it, yes, it was a completely male-dominated uh, genre, and um, still is. Still, I mean, it's changed uh, well, a lot. Well, not 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 as much. I mean, we got a lot of talented writers out there. Like, we got, oh yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, you know, but got, it's still, it's still some some uh, progress to be made. Right, but I mean, definitely, we can't discount that anymore because I mean, it's it's there's so many great female writers out there now that have wrote some books recently that I really enjoy, like, uh, like Charlie Jane Anders, all the birds in the sky. That That's a really cool book. That was really one of my favorite books of, uh, past couple of years. Um, Delilah Dawson, she's another good writer. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but it seems to be more, um, more accepted now, I guess, you know, it's more open People are more open. They're, they're, the barriers aren't like... <laughs> I think the last of them died. I think when um, um, uh, Ellison died, that was pretty much the end of that bullshit. So <laughs> well, that's interesting you mentioned that. I mean, not to say that Ellison was like a complete misogynist, but you know, I'm saying like with that mentality, yeah, he, really, he was he, like the <clears throat> last of the, that, those kind of writers that seemed to be in that male-dominated, you know, high-ego male... Uh, era yeah, like <laughs> Michael Crichton. Well, he had ER, so his head just fucking blew right up. He didn't. Yeah, then Jurassic Park. Come on, man. So yeah, he was a pioneer for some reason. I mean, uh, ER was really my favorite show. It wasn't Coma? Wasn't that Peter Straub? Was it? Or was it Michael? Wasn't it not Michael? What was the was other guy? Michael Crichton. No. I don't think it. No, 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 no. Um, Robin Cook. Robin Cook. I think it was Robin Cook, yeah. yeah he's the one that did the... Coma. Uh, he did, like, all the weird medical, because he was a doctor. You know? Yeah, it was, like, 70s and the 80s. He did, mm-hmm. like, a series of medical books that were fiction, fictional, like, over-the-top dramatic like, things. Like, gotcha. coma. They put you yeah. in a fake coma to harvest your organs. Oh, that's yeah. where that came from. That was on ABC. It was a TV movie. No, I mean, I think it really happened in Brazil. It still happens in Brazil. I'm sure. All right, so I'll skip Brazil. Yes, do it. It's happening in Kevin's basement. You got nice <laughs> organs. So, oh. yeah, just, you know, prime. Stay away from Brazil. No. I don't want the yeah, black market trade. Always oh, smells like antiseptic in here. <laughs> I wouldn't worry about that. I wouldn't worry too much. Uh, the French drain and the sump pump are unrelated to all of this. Okay. <laughs> uh,. But as an African American female, you know, being in this male dominated uh field, she she really just ignored all the barriers and confinements of racism and uh you know, just went past all of its destructiveness to become uh one of the most incredible sci fi speculative fiction writers in history. Uh, one of her first attempts was a rewrite of a sci fi movie called Devil Girl from Mars, which I hope has a lot of bikinis, the original. <laughs> Uh, and what she drafted uh, wound up becoming the foundation for her Patternist series about a secret history, which uh, covers ancient Egyptians up to the far-flung future with telepathy and alien plagues throughout. Sounds like a lot of fun. Also kind of sounds like Stargate. <clears throat> Space locusts. <laughs> Is this where ancient aliens guy came from? This well, is, it could be. It could, could be, be his argued. inspiration. Could be his inspiration. Oh, wow. Could have been. Yeah, that uh, guy has fantastic hair. Okay. So now, so now I gotta look back and see if there's any mention, like thank you to Octavia or something, in the Stargate shows movies. Probably not. Probably not. Nobody does it. that. Wasn't Stargate a Cameron joint anyway? No, no, that was the uh, original one. Wasn't no, that was those are the Independence Day people. Emmerich. 
Oh, Emmerich, right. And Devlin. Before he tried destroying the world in every movie. Hal Emmerich. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Octavia, she attended workshops. Rolling. Was it? Yeah. What? What did you say? Roland Emmerich. <laughs> That's the devil girl from Mars. Oh, my God, that looks awesome. <laughs> the devil girl from Mars looks amazing. The woman's wearing, like, a rubber suit and a rubber hat. Looks amazing. I thought it was Angelica Houston. So did I. Yeah. Or yeah. I thought it was, uh, what's her name when she was in um, Indiana Jones? Uh, Kate Blanchett in Indiana Jones. you got to protect your whole entire body except for you. Sweet thighs. Oh, See, we were talking yeah. about that. I think one one point we we're talking about the uh, armor on women. Mm-hmm. Oh, right. Like Just how, cover. How, yeah. how practical it is. It <laughs> covers areolas, and 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 that's it. That's <laughs> all you need. That's, um, that's the weak spot. That's. <laughs> I remember you mentioned. So that, that's how that's that's how they remain swift. Oh yeah, you got to have uh, full freedom of movement there. Dodge roll. <laughs> So, yeah, Octavia, she attended uh, writing workshops while working odd jobs um, and afforded her the luxury of writing at 3 a.m. in accordance with her strict writing schedule. I mean, because I guess, you know, the nightlife in L.A. was still happening then. So, you know, I mean, she just chose not to do that. She had to just sit there with her typewriter, same when she was a kid. And while at Pasadena City College, uh, she had the germ for an idea for Kindred, which is a story about a young black woman who marries a white man in 1976 California and uh, who is hurtled, through, uh, hurtled between her time and pre-Civil War Maryland, where this sounds like another book that just came out recently, a little while ago, mm-hmm. um, where she meets her ancestors, uh, a proud black free woman and a white planter who is a slave owner. Uh, this sounds like that that show that uh, where the woman goes back to like Celtic times, Highlander or oh, Pathfinder. Pathfinder, yes, this is, it sounds like exactly like Pathfinder almost. I don't know if she meets her grandmother, but well, yeah. And there's a little mistake in the copy. The white planner is actually um, a great great grandfather, so he's not actually so he he becomes a slave owner later, but she ra- she meets him as a child. And what happens is that every time his life is threatened, she gets pulled out of her time into his time to, like, save him or do something for him. Now, at first, it's easy for her to get back. But as time progresses, like, it'll just happen out of nowhere. But her life has to be, like, in literal danger before she can get pulled back into her own life, her own timeline. We're talking about Kindred. Kindred, yes. Okay. Because the other show looks dumb. I don't, I don't. I'm not talking about Pathfinder. I have not watched a minute of it. I'm just aware of it. He's watched two minutes of it. <laughs> I haven't watched a minute. I've watched all of them. I haven't watched two milliseconds. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So that sounds like a pretty cool story. And one fateful day in 1970, she impressed a certain Mr. Harlan Ellison, who we were just talking about. And, and he's uh, cursing us out over with Carl Sagan, right? Carl Sagan's holding him back. Don't go through the microphone. Don't do it, Harlan. He's cocksucking. Get fucking. Get the fuck off. Har- fuck. Harlan. Harlan, calm down. There's fine, fine. Billions and billions of different ways we can resolve this. Go watch The Prisoner, the one that you did the intros for. No, I just for rolled billions shadow. and billions of joints. I'm Carl Sagan. <laughs> Fine, Carl. Thanks, Carl. Now you have no mouth. Thanks for talking me off the... You must scream. Oh, Oh, God. I was about to say that. (laughs) Everyone loves scream. Yeah, so she impressed Harlan Ellison with her work, which is... That's tough, because he didn't like anyone. He was... He didn't like himself. I don't think he even liked himself that much. But he encouraged her to... uh, attend the uh, the Clarion Science Fiction Writers Workshop in Clarion, Pennsylvania. And there she began a lifelong friendship with Samuel R. Delaney. And she wrote the Patternist series. She wrote Pattern Master, Mind of My Mind, Survivor, <clears throat> Wild Seed, and Clay's Ark. So that's a, that's a nice uh, that's a nice run of books. Yeah, that's the Patternist one. And those uh, stretched from uh, 1976 to 1984. And then a follow-up series she did was the uh, Zeogenesis, about aliens interbreeding with remaining humans. Most humanity has been extinct for a little bit. 
and uh, they create a new race with uh, some caveats. And uh, that starts with Dawn, Adulthood Rises. Right. Oh, sorry. Adulthood Rights, Imago, Zeogenesis, and Lilith's Brood. And those are from 1987 to 2000. Oh, wow. So those are still pretty recent. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, The Parable, which is a series about a supremeless creation of a community known as Earthseed after Earth society collapses. And it's undergone, uh, undergone climate change, corporate greed, and wealth inequity. The main character, Lauren, believes that the rest of humanity's destiny is to explore and multiply amongst the stars, which I, I agree. I'm down with that. You know, let's go to space. Let's go find some places. Yeah. Let's go fuck everything else up. Let's yeah, do let's it. get it. Space place. Space place. That, that's what I named my planet. Like, <laughs> planet space place. This is the dumbest fucking place. It's like, sucks. I would yeah. name it Bob, definitely. Titan, planet Bob? Yeah, Titan AE really got me when I was a kid. Oh, man. I'm a bun Bob. But yeah, the Parable of the Sower series, that was that was good. The you, par- you read those? It was uh, two of them. It was Parable of the Sowers and Parable of the Talents. Because that was a that was play, a play off the Talented Ten about like the uh, back in the day NAACP, the Talented Ten, the uh, African Americans, and the uh, Talented Ten being the leaders and so forth to help the others rise up. Nice. But, yeah, that was pretty cool. But she didn't get to. She didn't finish it. She uh, she kind of gave up. Yeah, she was supposed to do a third one, and um, she had a couple of false starts, and so she she wound up stopping. Uh, it's got to be tough. I mean, uh, you know, your first series that was a long stretch. That was uh, what like eighteen years over. You know, writing there or eight years rather. So, yeah. um, and just think of how many times she may have started, and just like I didn't like it. Mm-hmm. Did something else, and then didn't like it. Sure, so. certainly. You know, we're we're our own worst critics. Mm-hmm. Self editing, and, and yeah, she uh, could have been working on that forever, for all we know. But I would say one of the crowning achievements, actually, the crowning achievement for her, was in '95 when she got the Mac, uh, MacArthur Fellowship, first sci-fi writer to ever win the MacArthur Fellowship. Wow, and it came with a, it's a yeah, two hundred ninety five thousand dollar prize. Wow, and an even bigger milestone is the first African American woman sci fi writer to mm-hmm. win the MacArthur Prize or the uh, yeah, <coughs> yeah, you're right, MacArthur Foundation Fellowship. Right, and uh, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, geez, um, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna have to read read the series now. I, I, I've never really been a huge fan of like the time travel stuff. Mm-hmm. Because uh, it always gets messy, the continuities and, and weird, you know, no, whatever she, the MacGuffin shit. The show. That's the thing about it. she. She she must have done an incredible amount of research just on her own to figure out, like you know, based off of her life and what she had seen, what she was inspired by, and created. She created her own world. Sure, you know, because yeah. my my entry to her was uh, Kindred, and then after Kindred, I read the two parable books, and then I started um, the. Uh, not Xeno G- Genesis, the other one there. The first series we talked about, the uh... Pattern Master. Sorry, I have a few of those books too, still. And then her last book, which was Fledgling, and that one, that that one's pretty d- interesting. So those are about uh, um, it's a, it's a departure really from the sci-fi genre that she was normally writing. It's a uh, it's about a vampire trope, um, and. It follows uh, Shori, who's a 53-year-old vampire that looks like a 10-year-old African-American girl. Mm-hmm. And she's uh, part of a tribe called the Ina, nocturnal, long-lived, they drink blood. Um, and they have human hosts that can live to be almost 200 years old, as the Ina need humans to survive, although they're superior in strength, agility, healing. Um, they sound like more reasonable vampires, really. You know, they kind of just, hey, we'll mm-hmm. give you some life, we just got to eat off for like a couple hundred years yeah right it's like it's like the uh people in blade how they were marked right right you know, right blade too and the humans need the toxin of the ina to survive and uh because of the withdrawal from it, it could kill them mm-hmm. so it's a symbiotic relationship 
right? Yeah, yeah if they get to live for 200 years, I'm like, yeah, whatever. You can take sure. a little snack every now and then. Right. <laughs> like, can I take a holiday when I need to, though? <laughs> yeah, is that cool? Or i got to go see one of my four families because I live way longer than any of them. Here, I'm going to give you some of my blood. Let me get some of that toxin. We good, right? Yeah, I really hate Kevin, and like he always needs toxin in his turkey on Thanksgiving. Um, he's, like, older than all of us, and he looks like he's 20. This is ridiculous. I can't stand this. It's my turkey toxins, bro. He's my great-great uncle. Can't wait till you die in 50 years. Joke's on you. I ain't never going to die. <laughs> they won't need your blood forever. <laughs> but unfortunately, uh, Octavia's life uh, was short and ended in 2006. She uh, she fell and, and hit her head after having a stroke. Um, 58 years too young. She blazed her own trail. And although uh, some writer's block and depression slowed her output near the end of her day, she still created more... Incredible words and visions that anyone could ever dream in creating. Fifty times the amount of the time the world has blessed her with her presence. We're not going to have somebody like this again. You know, not for a long, long time. No, it, it could happen sooner. I'm hoping sooner than later. Well, we personally. hope. We hope. But, that, I mean, there's just the, you know, getting the MacArthur Award as a sci-fi writer and an African-American woman all combined. Just an incredible achievement. Also, lighting ways for, for other young women out there, I would hope, you know, to feel that they, they can achieve goals like similar to this. Or all people that just feel that what they may have is crippling or they're unable to do something, don't, don't, don't give up before you can even try. And she, she did it all just to prove her aunt wrong. Right. Because rebellion is good sometimes. Rebellion is good most of the time, I feel. Because if you if you're gonna let somebody just tell you how you have to live your life and what you can and cannot do, mm-hmm. then you know you don't really deserve to have many good things happen. I think because you're just sheltering yourself, sheltering yeah. yourself. Because they ain't living at all. Nah, Beastie Boys are right all along. You gotta fight for your right to party. Bingo. That's right. Because cake pie and ice cream doesn't go good without a party. But you gotta fight for your party to be right. And then no sleep till the bum, party. Bum, bum, bum. No sleep till Brass Monkey. Yeah. No sleep till Brooklyn Cheesecake. Yeah. yeah. Cheesecake Factory? Fuck no. No sleep till the Cheesecake Factory. I think it's like 10 minutes away. I don't know, but <laughs> if you're really tired, you can sleep. Oh, thank goodness I'm exhausted. <laughs> so, yeah, those, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really kind of... Uh, not, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to think of the words, but, um, you know, Taylor seemed like somebody who just was never happy with who she was. Um, and it, it really affected everyone in her life, even though uh, she was a great writer and she, you know, mistaken as a man. But uh, she, she never really just seemed to, to grasp how, you know, I don't know, how great her life could have been. That's what it seemed like to me. And or how great life could be in general. Right, or great life really is. You know, and then we have Octavia Butler who broke so many barriers and, and, and just smashed through hurdles to get to where she is. Yeah, she's, was. Ins- she's super inspirational. Yeah, mm. for sure. For sure. You know, and, and this is two similar talent arcs and uh and definitely just tip tip scales you know if you if you look at these two stories um someone who didn't appreciate their gift and someone who who used it to just ignite a path go through their whole life it's amazing yeah there were attempts to adapt some of her stuff i believe the sower one was adapted i have to double check I could see the. Well, I guess now that that other show is out, I don't think they would do the uh, the Martin. kindred. But the parable series could be interesting to do. I don't see why they. they there should be no reason why they shouldn't do kindred because honestly, to have another perspective to show that you know stories like this exist, that's important. Doesn't matter, <clears throat> and also that shows the commonality that we have 
regardless of our differences. True. So, True. you know, something like that. I think Who it'd be knows? damn good. Actually, there's a graphic novel adaptation, too, and you know I've got it. So. Okay. Well, I have to borrow that, then. I'll check that out. Yeah. I have the book, too. So I want to check out that uh, the Xenogenesis. That sounds pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, sounds cool, too, right? Yeah. yeah. Getting, yeah. like, a Mass Effect vibe from it. Right. I have to look back. I think I may have a few of those, so. Cool. Um, yeah, I, I had all of them and never finished all of them, but well, they've been scattered all over. I'm going to follow Lee back to his house and take most of his books again. Because yeah. I borrowed some of his books for like five years once. Yeah. I still have some. Yeah, probably. So I'll have to borrow some more. Yeah. My little, my gotta, little Lee Noble shelf. Build up your collection over right. there. Yeah, I have my tiny little one, one-tiered one Lee Noble shelf. So, so, so that don't take too much. So right. this is what happens when you ask him to help catalog. And he's like, before you add this to the catalog, could I borrow it? Sure, yeah. Five uh, years later. Oh, I've wanted to read this, yeah. But he helps me out because then it goes up in value, and I'm like, yep, time to sell. Right, nice. It's It's all on accidentally purposeful (laughs) stuff that I do. It's wonderful. (laughs) It's really good. Very impressive. I accidentally on purpose do this accidentally. Well, on that note, I'm going to go follow him, take his books, and then train myself how to dream and dream in a series. Because that sounds awesome. Yeah, that does sound awesome. I'm going to train myself really hard just let's see if we can all train ourselves separately and, okay and, and we'll come back we'll re- over the course of right because i won't need netflix ever again it'll save me a lot of money yeah and we could be making money by writing this stuff down and giving to the people to watch on netflix yeah. score not if people don't believe us be good to yourselves be good to everyone i'm jason i'm kevin and I'm Lee. We're the Weird and the Weary. Catch us online, www.weirdandweary.com. Instagram at Weird and the Weary. Twitter at Weird and Weary. We're around. We're all over the place. If you don't think we're there, we're probably there too. Yeah, I'm checking the the spam and junk mail filters for the emails that get sent to me. Ding! Boop! J.K.L. Media. Jekyll.